When you're sitting using your computer watching YouTube videos like this, or you're on your smartphone scrolling through TikTok videos, Facebook posts, or watching the news, for example, I bet the last thing that goes through your mind is, I wonder how much all of this is costing to run. In the last 40 years, we've gone from the earliest microprocessor-based devices, which were things like games consoles and the first home computers, and no internet, to a world where almost everything we use has got a microprocessor in it, and many of those are internet capable and connect to servers somewhere in the cloud for updates or to store information. Almost everything we do now has some connection to the internet somewhere along the way. Many of these things we use with little or no direct cost to us other than our own time and of course forced advertising. But every single bit of data that is changed from a zero to a one or vice versa in every one of the billions of digital devices incurs a tiny cost in energy. It was once thought that information such as the digital zeros and ones in a computer cost nothing in the way of energy. But if that was the case, why did computers use so much power? It was Rolf Landauer, a physicist working at IBM in 1961, who discovered what is now known as Landauer's principle, in that any logical irreversible operation that manipulates or destroys information such as flipping bits from zero to one or vice versa increases entropy which is dissipated as heat. The amount of energy for flipping a bit is actually so incredibly minuscule at 2.9 times 10 to the power of minus 21 joules that no one would notice it. But our computing devices now contain so many billions of MOSFETs that change billions or trillions of bits of data per second that this simple operation starts to use quite a lot of energy, and almost all of it is dissipated in the form of heat. The NVIDIA RTX 4090 video card in my computer when it's rendering or playing games can almost double up as a space heater for my room, dissipating up to 450 watts of power, all as heat. And that's not including the extra 125 watts coming from the Intel i9-1290K as well. And it's not like these things work in isolation. We now have data centers and AI server farms which have hundreds of thousands of CPUs and tens of thousands of GPUs. The amount of heat produced by them becomes a major problem and requires huge industrial scale air conditioning and cooling systems which just vent this excess heat into the environment. In 2024, ChatGPT was receiving about 12 million queries a day and had 100 million active subscribers a month and was costing over $100,000 a day to run. Much of that would have been in energy costs. This is the reason why so many data centers are now being built either with the associated wind, solar farms, or near geothermal or hydroelectric plants. Electrical power is the primary cost, which is one of the reasons why the UK has so few large data centers. Electricity here is some of the most expensive in the world. If you want to make a profitable business out of data centers, then you need as cheap a form as electricity as possible. A recent DOE report found that in the US alone in 2023, 4.4% or 176 terawatt hours of all electricity generation went into powering data centers, and that this is estimated to rise to between 6.7 and 12%, or between 325 to 580 terawatts by 2028. And this doesn't include all the tens of millions of end user computers and smartphones that these data centers are talking to. One of the most power intensive sectors is video streaming, with companies like Netflix, and in particular YouTube, drawing the most amount of power. Bitcoin mining is another significant user of power, which is comparable to the electricity consumption of some countries. In 2024, the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index estimated that Bitcoin mining used 19 gigawatts of power, which is 0.6 to 2.3% of the United States electricity demand. AI is also expected to dramatically increase the amount of energy it's using in the near future. In 2023, in the US, AI consumed around 8 terawatt hours, 
This is expected to grow to 52 terawatt hours by 2026, a 550% increase. And by 2030, it's expected to be 652 terawatt hours, a 1,150% increase on 2024 levels. This is driven not only by the increasing number of accelerator chips made by the likes of NVIDIA, AMD and Intel, but also each chip is becoming more computationally powerful and consuming more power. For example, NVIDIA's A100 accelerator consumes up to 250 watts. The newer H100 consumes up to 350 watts, a 75% increase in GPU power consumption within two years across one generation of chips. AMD's MI250 accelerators draw 500 watts of power, while the MI300 consumed 750 watts of power. And Intel's recently cancelled hybrid AI processor using the Gordy 3 accelerator, codenamed Falcon Shores, was expected to consume 1500 watts of power. But this will now be replaced by a newer version called Jaguar Shores. As you may well know, I do a lot of tech history videos. But what about the history of you and me, our ancestors? Where did they come from and who were they? My attempts to build a family tree had failed before, so partnering with my heritage was a chance to finally get somewhere with my family tree. My heritage is the number one family history service with over 90 million users and offers a wide range of facilities to help you build your family tree in a fun and easy way, especially if you're like me and you don't have a great deal of information to go on as it has access to over 33 billion historical records. My dad had me late and he was born in 1899. So everything on my dad's side was back in the 1800s with less than ideal records. But with just my father's details, I'd gotten farther with my heritage than anything else before. From here, I was able to go back seven generations to the early 1700s with the Research This Person link. Someone who was important in my family tree but I didn't know much about was my great-grandmother. My father told me about my great-grandfather who was a surgeon's assistant and they had 10 kids. He died aged 36 and she was left to bring up the eight surviving children alone. Through a connection with another family tree which my heritage discovered, I can see that she was one of 10 children and that also opens up the family tree an awful lot. My heritage will try to find matches with other family trees. In fact, it's allowed me to find connections with other ones, not only in the UK, but also in the US and Australia, that I had no idea even existed. To make your family tree look better and easier to navigate, you can also add old photos of relatives and you can colorize black and white photos using the colorize tool to see what they would look like in a modern color style. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial to enjoy all the amazing features that MyHeritage has to offer with the following link in the description below or in the first pinned comment. Increasing chip densities, packing on more MOSFETs into the same area also increases the heat density, basically the amount of heat dissipated per square centimeter. We are also now reaching the limits of how small we can make the transistors or MOSFETs in high-performance CPUs, GPUs, and accelerator chips. To squeeze more computing power onto smaller spaces, chips could be stacked on top of each other, creating effectively a 3D computer cube instead of it all being on a single flat profile die as they are at the moment. The limitation here is removing the heat generated from the chips that will be inside the stack of dies. If the heat cannot be dissipated, hotspots can occur and literally burn out the MOSFETs. Because of the heat density of modern chips, many of them now cannot run with all the MOSFETs working at once. They would just get too hot, so only parts of the chip are running whilst the rest is turned off. Currently, to cool chips down, you would need to mount a heatsink, a thinned piece of aluminium or copper fixed to the outside of the chip. This would either be air-cooled, as in the case of most home and office computers, or liquid-cooled for high-performance computing. Currently, the highest heat density of currently available commercial chips peaks at about 100 watts per square centimetre. But DARPA have been working on chip technologies that can reach up to 1,000 watts per square centimetre for high-performance radar and supercomputers. These use liquid-coolant 
directly in the chips themselves through tiny micro channels using an electrically insulating liquid. This is how it's been done for decades, pushing ever increasing performance, but with energy wastefulness, even though the amount of power used per MOSFET has decreased enormously over this time. The number of MOSFETs crammed into dye real estate has increased exponentially, creating these ever hotter chips and the more drastic methods to keep them cool and from burning out. But what if we could create a form of computing that would use radically less power in the first place? We could have more computing power in smaller packages because you don't have to deal with the heat. And this was first proposed by Rolf Landau in the 1960s. If you remember what I said about Landau's principle in which any logically irreversible operation that destroyed information dissipated energy as heat, well, you might be wondering what logical irreversibility means. Many physical operations could be thought of as being reversible. The laws of physics work equally well going forwards or backwards. And here is an example of that. Imagine you're a commander in the army and an enemy artillery gun is firing at your position and you want to know where the gun is to launch counterfire. If you can track the projectile on its final approach with radar, you can reverse the progress of the ballistic action back to where the gun is and find its position. And this is what happens in the modern military. Currently, all our computing logic is irreversible. Logic that flows only in one direction from input to output. If we know what the inputs are, we know what the output will be. But if we only know what the output value is, we can currently never know for certain what the inputs were. To give you a simple example using a two input AND gate, two out of the four combinations of zero and one could occur on the inputs. But there is only one condition where the output would be one. The other three would all result in zero. But if we looked at the output only, we would not be able to tell what the condition of the inputs would be on three of the four possible logical inputs. Now you may be wondering what this has got to do with power consumption. Well, Landau thought that if you stored the input as well as the output, you could reverse the operation and then use that stored energy to power the next operation. But at the time, that would take up too much memory, so it was impractical to do. Later, others, including Richard Feynman, proposed that if you could create a reversible logic gate that would be able to compute the opposite of the answer or decompute the output, you could then store that information as energy. It could then be used to power the next logical operation and effectively use little to no power to perform it. This principle is analogous to regenerative braking in an electric vehicle. When the vehicle is driving along normally, it will be using power from the battery. But when you take your foot off the accelerator, the motor turns into a generator and feeds the power back into the battery using the kinetic energy of the car as it slows down. Even in a modest EV, this can reduce the power consumption by up to 35%. And in a computer using reversible logic, this will be much higher and theoretically be able to reduce the amount of power required to perform logical operations by more than three orders of magnitude or a thousand times less, although there will always be some very small losses. The type of gates used will be along the lines of a C knot or a controlled knot gate or a CC knot or controlled controlled knot gate. These are also known as Feynman gates or Toffoli gates and are used in quantum computers to form classical Boolean logic with the quantum states. In these, one of the inputs is also an output, and knowing this, you can work out what the input must have been to reverse the operation. These must also be adiabatic circuits, ones that use reversible logic to conserve energy. In an adiabatic circuit, the MOSFET would only turn on when there is no voltage across the drain and source, and only turn off when there is no current flowing through it, which reduces power consumption. The circuit uses elements that can store energy, like an LC network or an inductor and capacitor as part of a power supply, that converts the initial logic switching into a magnetic flux, 
and then releases that energy when the reverse computation takes place to power the circuit. Normally these inductors have been too large to fit on the chip, but in a new development these have been embedded into the chip. This makes it still quite a bit larger than say 7 nanometer technology, but it's all built in. When switching, instead of a hard on off switch, using adiabatic techniques, the voltage is controlled to build up more slowly at a resonant frequency matching that of the LC network. Using the reversible logic to decompute the logical function, the switching energy effectively bounces back and forth between computing the output and decomputing the output through the LC circuit, requiring very little extra power as it is stored and then reused instead of being dissipated as heat. It's only been in the last few years that this has been seen as a practical solution, and in 2025, Ver Computing, a joint UK-US company, will release the first near-zero energy processor. If this works as expected, it could trigger a new wave of near-zero technology that will use a tiny fraction of the power of today's processors. The goal of Ver is not to create processors with a small number of very high performance cores like today with chips that run hot, but processors with a large number of ultra efficient cores where the chips run cold. A couple of caveats here is that because the chips by their very nature of having embedded inductors will be larger than the current technologies and also slower. But because there is virtually no heat dissipated, they could be packaged in ways which are virtually impossible using traditional VSI technologies. And there has been a lot of interest from AI chip manufacturers. It might be too soon to say, but I think the days of using my PC as a space heater might be coming to an end in the not too distant future. So I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, then please thumbs up, share and subscribe. And a big thanks go to all of our patrons for their ongoing support. Don't forget to check out the MyHeritage 14-day free trial at the following link in the description below or in the first pinned comment.